Hey folks, Joseph A. Sabora here, once again doing another movie review in the month of October. Why not The Blob? Now, I'm actually going to be reviewing the 1988 horror remake that's based on the original 1958 B-movie classic which launched the career of Steve McQueen, the legendary actor who had its TV series called Wanted Dead or Alive. He has a Western TV series. He later went on to do his success with films like The Great Escape, Bullet, The Getaway, yeah, the original Getaway, and even The Towering Inferno. Yeah. And this became a film franchise with films like Son of Blob and Beware of the Blob that was directed by Larry Hagman. Yes, the same man from the TV show that I Dream a Genie and Dallas. Yeah, J.R. himself. <laughs> Yeah, J.R. Urine. Okay. Now, this version is released by TriStar Pictures. Yep. Which is a side diary of Sony. But of course, when this came out, um, Sony didn't bought the company. It was under the joint venture of Columbia Pictures, HBO, and CBS. Which HBO and CBS had left. And Columbia just became full-time ownership of the company. Anyway. Well, this time they took the original source material and decided to update it uh, with a new style. I mean, only this time have a smart and intelligent script and also have state-of-the-art special effects. That was actually done by DreamQuest Images, among other companies joining in to create this slimy, gooey, gelatin-like substance that terrorizes the entire town. And that's what the blob is called. Unfortunately, the film was a box office disappointment, earning $8.2 out of its $19 million budget. Yeah, I mean, they were hoping that this one was going to become a huge hit of the summer, because 88 was the year where we had a lot of summer films coming out, and hoping this could work well for its 30th anniversary of the original, but sadly, no dice. And they team up with Chuck Russell, the writer and director who went on to do The Mask with Jim Carrey. He also did um, Eraser with Arnold Schwarzenegger. And Frank Darabont, who's been best known for writing and directing the Stephen King novel called The Shawshank Redemption and then later The Green Mile. Uh, both Chuck Russell and Frank Darabont were together ever since they worked on the movie A Nightmare on Elm Street Free Dream Warriors. So they figured you know, they could team up to work on a, a classic that people remember from through drive-in movies or any other that would actually work well for the 80s. And that's where they came up with the script. With Russell directing it. So yeah, this was a great idea because this was in the tradition of films like The Fly and The Faint. I mean, both of them came out in the 50s as well. I mean, as opposed to The Blob. And they actually updated it very well for the 80s. Because when you get state-of-the-art special effects that's more gorier than ever before, you know you're going to be scared. And plus, it almost looks as realistic as possible. So it, it proves that, yes, you can do a movie that's not laughable or anything. But of course, The Fly was the, the biggest hit of them all you know, out of the free films that we had um, back in the 80s. Because even though we were getting like several movies that are not exactly you know, remakes, or, or sometimes they would be. Yeah, I mean, there, was, there were a lot of remakes that come out uh, during that time, but... But at that point on, this was back when remakes uh, were full improvements over the original films. Um, it actually proves that you can actually do justice to them if the material actually fails the first time. Nowadays, with today's remakes, they just don't seem to care. All they care about is money, box office revenue. You know, they they don't care about the story or the idea. You know, all they care about is you know. Let's just put in some more CGI effects. Let's cast some bad actors who can't even act. 
let's uh, add all, all this other stupid shit that has that just um, insults everyone's intelligence I mean they just want more quantity than quality that's the problem so a movie like The Blob as well as uh, The Fly and, and The Fiend really does prove something that you can update something that works and sadly I, I wish we had films like this these days but I know it's hard because I know they're trying to prove something for, for a new generation to come. Apparently they are going to remake this again. No need. I'm sorry. I know Rob Zombie was going to do one before, but that never happened. And then they were going to get Simon West, um, the same man who gave us uh, Con Air, to, to do this. So I don't know how that's going to happen. And they were going to get Samuel Jackson to star. There's no way that that film's going to top the 1988 film, yet alone the 1950s version, but whatever. Um, also to note that I think this is one of the better remakes than, than the 1958 original because of the idea. Like, you can actually make it more scarier than ever. Plus, with a nice cast joining in, I mean some new some cast members who later become you know, famous for other films you know, like Kevin Dillon who went on to do uh, No Escape which was now known as Escape from Aslam or Shawnee Smith uh, went on to do the movie Who's Harry Crumb with John Candy released by the same studio and she would later went on to do uh, the Saul films but she was also in the TV series Becker with uh, Ted Danson plays a dim-witted receptionist. Yeah. <laughs> you also got Bo uh, Bilincelia, been best known for doing voice acting of several anime shows like Cowboy Bebop, as well as Digimon, and Naruto, among others. So it's nice to see that he's actually playing a role in the film. Art Lafleur which, interestingly enough, he was from the movie The Sandlot. <laughs> I'm wearing that t-shirt, by the way. So, yeah, he actually plays uh, Babe Ruth um, in that film. But he's he's the father in this one. And, and he also got Kenny Clark. Yeah, from Q the Wind Serpent and Blue Thunder, as well as um, Buffy the Vampire Slayer. <laughs> yeah. So what a guess. Oh, and by the way, the film is going to be released um, next week. On Blu-ray, they're going to have a collector's edition Screen Factory release with tons of features joining in. So I can't wait to see that. Because it got released previously by Twilight Time. Went out of print a few years ago. Because I know that's how Twilight Time is. They always charge you like 30 bucks to get this. and then, But then next thing you know, they sold out really quickly. So that, that's a shame. But I'm just happy to see that it's finally going to get another Blu-ray release, and hopefully this will do justice. So let's review the remake. Stars Kevin Dillon, Shawnee Smith, Donovan Leach, Jeffrey Dumont, Kenny Clark, Joe Seneca, Del Close, Paul McQuain, Robert Axelrod, Bo Binslea, Michael Canworthy, Douglas Emerson, Art Lafleur. Sharon Spielman, Bill Mosley, you know, from the Texas Chainsaw Massacre Part 2, among other films. Eric Laniac, Playboy Playmates, went on to do the TV series Baywatch. Uh, the Steven Seagal film, Under Siege. And of course, the remake of <laughs> The Billy Hillbillies, uh, based on the TV series. Ricky Paul Golden, Jack Radar. And Julie McCullough. It's written by Chuck Russell along with Frank Darabont. That's based on the original blog by Theodore Simonson and Kay Linacre. And it's directed by, once again, Chuck Russell. The movie began set in a town called Arsonville, California. There was a football game that happened. That's where we meet three high school students. Uh, one is a football player named Paul Taylor, played by Donovan Leach. The other is a cheerleader named Meg Penny, played by Shawnee Smith. 
And we meet a rebel teenager named Brian Flagg, played by Kevin Dillon. So, the team actually won while Brian is uh, performing a motorcycle stunt through the bridge. Didn't quite make it, but the old man actually cheered on, because you know, at least he tried. His motorcycle uh, broke, so he decided to take it to a mechanic named Mosley Woodley, played by Bill Benslea. So they, they fixed his motorcycle and everything's running perfectly. Um, so during that night, just when uh, Meg and Paul were going on a date, a meteorite that came from the sky suddenly crashes uh, at town. The old man spotted it, and that's where the meteorite cracks into a massive, slimy, gooey, um, gelatin-like substance appeared and attaches his hand. He tries to cut it off with a knife, but apparently he, he did cut himself accidentally, so he couldn't take it off. And then Brian, Meg, and Paul I came along to take him directly to the hospital, so that way they can take off uh, the blob, and that's what it's called, by the way, the blob, out of his hand, and hoping that it would be surgically removed but it was too late because it actually burned his entire body you know, leaving just his, uh, his chest and, and his head. The blob appears uh, directly from the next room just when Paul was ready to call the police and it grew larger and bigger than ever before and starts to take Paul, squeeze him and being sucked into it, oozing it out just when May came and and screams and, and tries to take uh, Paul out of the, the blob but his arm suddenly came out and yeah you know, with with all the blood and, and guts going around squeezing him and she was knocked unconscious holding the arm of Paul till um, she was being taken back home by her parents which is a pharmacist named Tom Penny, played by Art Lafleu, which he earlier had met uh, Paul. Um, and then and Deborah Penny, played by um, Sharon Spillman. Yeah. So they also have a younger brother named Kevin, who joins them with his friend. Um, and Kevin is uh, played by uh, Michael Kenworthy. He wanted to go out to, to see a movie with his friend. It's a horror slasher film. That's like uh, Friday the 13th mixed in with the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Yeah, you get a, a serial killer with a hockey mask and a chainsaw. You know, going around killing people. You know, teenagers. <laughs> so this is like a tribute to all these horror slasher films that we got in the 70s and 80s. So. Also to note that the, the movie theater scene um, was actually homage to the original 1958 film. So it's great to see that they actually include that in this version to make it more updated. Before we get to that, um, Brian and Meg had suddenly encountered with the police. Um, apparently Brian got arrested because they claimed that he was the one that killed Paul but he didn't do anything so you know he couldn't be trusted so then uh, both Brian and Meg had met at the diner where Meg suddenly tells Brian that the blob which came directly from the hand of the old man grew bigger and kills Paul but Brian didn't believe in, in her story but it just seemed like by that point on, you know, because he was just having a sandwich and everything, because he just had such an off day. Um, yeah, in fact, uh, the waitress, um, who's the owner of the diner, is run by Frank Hewitt, played by Kenny Clark. Uh, they were about to close up the place anyway, because, you know, it was late at night. Uh, we also join in with uh, the diner's handyman, who's a cook, got sucked in by the blob, directly from the, the storm drain of the sink and they just pulled them in straight into it 
and then the blob suddenly splashes up up on top of the the ceiling and it just continues to, to grow and starts attacking both Fran as well as Brian and Meg. So they went straight to the freezer so that way they can get away from the blob. And the blob actually went straight into the the under um, door of of the freezer but only burns like half of the like tiny bits of it. So yeah it came like so it became ice because we did learn that the freezer can kill a blob. It's going to be spoilers. Uh, Brian and Meg had escaped, uh, hoping that the blob had continued. <laughs> of course, he, he actually uh, knocked uh, knocked the strawberry jam. <laughs> and then um, the blob uh, suddenly went straight from the sewers because it went underneath and just popped up and and actually went straight into the telephone booth where Fran was about to call the sheriff but it was too late because he was squeezed completely by the blob and yeah, then blood and, and guts uh, and gory as the blob grew bigger and bigger and it starts to go straight into the sewers once again all over town so it's very powerful so both Meg and Brian have returned to the police station to find out what's going on with this blob that's appearing around town until they're being taken by a military operation that's being led by Dr. Meadows. I mean, he ordered the town with the two teens being quarantined. So they want to take them directly to the vans to check to see if they're not affected. And they're about to go after the the blob so that way they can collect it. I mean because they've been trying to find this uh, this meteorite for years. Brian escapes. Meg was taken to town which then she learns that her younger brother Kevin is missing which yep he went to see the movie uh, with his best friend and that's when the blob suddenly came directly from the air bins, attacked the projectionists and then the feeder owners and, and it starts to attack the whole audience uh, around including the guy yeah the one who's like talking uh, through the movie rudely yeah and he was the one that actually starts to throw stuff at Kevin telling him to be quiet and yeah he got what he deserved <laughs> so May came to the rescue uh, picks up Kevin and his friend so they went straight into the sewers so to, to get away from the blob, but it continues uh, to hit under the sewer and actually picks up Kevin's friend, so it was killed. Military um, guys out there, you know, dressing up with these uh, those protective suits that they had to wear, um, they came in and, and then the, and they were ready to shoot and contaminated the blob. Just when Brian was about to pick up uh, Meg and Kevin out of there so they'd be safe to go into another area. But actually, both uh, Meg and Brian were joining in with uh, one of the members. Uh, they were stuck in the sewers and they're about to find a way out. But Dr. Meadows decided uh, let's just um, let's just block the entire sewer so. Just bringing the 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 band to um, cover it because they decided not to take uh, Brian and Meg out of there. Not even the other guy. So yeah, he Doctor Meadows was an asshole. Should have never done that. But hey, now you know when you can't be trusted. So then um, Brian had took out the the bazooka and shot the. The sewer up uh, top that blocks it from the band and explodes, and they got out of there as soon as possible. While the blob uh, suddenly got Dr. Metals completely through the sewer. They actually took out the guy out of there. And then the rest of the military uh, decided to put in all these uh, bombs to destroy the blob, but then, of course, as uh, Brian said, we pissed it off. So it starts to grow 
even larger than ever before and starts to attack everyone in town trying to find a safe place to get away from it we learned that its weakness for the blob is to freeze it so what he did was Brian went to the town's garage and gets out um, a snowmaker truck that has canisters of liquid nitrogen attached to it so that way it can stop the blob completely but Meg joins in to, to save him because already the blob is covering the entire truck with him inside so Meg took out the AK-47 to to uh, scare it off and it just continues until finally he took uh, Brian out of there and then the entire truck explodes you know, along with the liquid nitrogen and, and it kills the entire blob so now it's all frozen so they're all safe and of course to note that yes the blob is a creature but it moves around like it so it turns into all these crystal like uh, ice as we saw before this is where we also learn about what happened next when the Reverend um, Jacob Meeker and he was the one who actually collected uh, the, the crystal uh, ice of what the blob came to be when he went directly to the diner. Um, he was actually performing a tent meeting uh, church service in the field and unfortunately his face was disconfigured. He yeah, got burned through his eye and his face because uh, the blob actually attacked him and burned his face completely. He collected the, the specimen of the blob directly from the jar and that's when we know that well we'll probably see what happens next. <laughs> yeah. Which almost sets up like a sequel bait ending in a way. It's an excellent uh, remake and I love it. No doubt, it. I, I love everything about it. It works. I thought it's actually one of the best horror remakes we ever got, um, next to The Fly and John Carpenter's The Fane. I mean, this was an excellent turn on on the original 50s B-movie classic. And it also proves that, yes, you could take the original material that failed the first time and, and improve upon it by using state-of-the-art special effects, which is so impressive, um, even for the 80s, because it looked really massively uh, awesome and cool I mean and it does create a lot of gore all the way that it can squeeze uh, attacks and sucks in and kills everyone in a very gruesome manner something you never thought you'd see compared to the original film that definitely sucks them completely so this was a significant upgrade um, and I love the cast. I mean, I, I definitely love uh, the actors Kevin Dillon, Johnny Smith, and as well as Candy Clark, Donovan Leach. They all did an excellent job, and it really shows. I mean, they played different characters compared to the ones you saw in the original. I love how, how much of a badass uh, Brian Flagg is. You know, very tough. But he is rebellious. I mean, he does have this particular attitude. He does want to deal with the four of the figures around. Yeah, it's not something you want to mess with. But that's how his attitude is. Uh, Meg Penny was actually very strong. I mean, for a cheerleader, I mean, we knew that she has been going through having to deal with this, this slimy creature that's appearing at town and trying to stop it. Trying to save uh, her younger brother, too. I mean, and the fact that she lost her boyfriend, uh, Paul, is sad, I know. But it's it's great, I mean, to have to see her in a, uh, a horror film like this. Long before she went on to do other horror films in her entire career. She's very beautiful, too, especially for a cheerleader. Um, there is also a lot of uh, gruesome, gory scenes here and there that I can never forget. Like, for example, uh, uh, just when the, the blob uh, disappeared from the hospital, it suddenly appeared directly from a couple that we met, which includes uh, 
Vicky DeSoto and Scott Jeske, both played by Eric Galaniak and Ricky Paul Golden, who um, they were just about to have a date. You know, they, they spotted uh, something happening at the hospital. They're just they're going around drinking Hawaiian Punch until suddenly the blob went straight into inside the, the car and sucks um, sucks Vicky all the way straight into into entire body just when uh, Scott was ready to you know open up her blouse you know reviewing her her cleavage and she, she was already asleep all drunk so they're just hanging around but then both of them got sucked in very gory. Um, a lot of great practical effects in the mix, um, but they must have took a lot of time to put them all together. Um, they actually shot this movie in Louisiana, um, in Avonville. So this was like if they, like if California was was exactly what a small town would look like. Um, I guess another thing too was that they were going for a conspiracy theory like what it would have been like if if an identity like this comes from outer space and suddenly appears in the entire town but we all know that that wasn't going to happen but I guess they know they were going to go for like a, a secret government agency you know bringing in a biological weapon to to destroy everyone in town and, and it's kind of nice that they actually throw in the a military base where they actually wore all these protective suits so in case they don't get infected by by the specimen that's happening because that's another reason why they they want the whole town to be quarantined so they be safe so exactly what they have to go for um, um, but yeah the film could have done so well um, it would have worked well for the summer, but I guess if the film had came out in October, I think that would have been better. That's the remake of The Blob from 1988, and I give the movie five stars. I'm Joseph A. Sabora, and I'll see you later. Bye.